We're going to finish out Romans 11 and 12. We're looking at Romans 11. We're going to get through to 12. Still talking about faith and works together. And we're here clarifying faith as obedience to the gospel of Jesus and works as keeping the law of Moses. So we continue with that theme in Romans 11. It is 13 to 15 first where we set the stage because he interrupts the thought from uh, he interrupts the thought if you will to say now I'm speaking to you Gentiles so those who are not Jews at Rome or who are not formerly Jewish at Rome are being addressed directly here inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous so, in whatever measure he is an apostle or has been sent to the nations, really, uh, he says, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous. So he said, Wh whatever small portion I might have uh, in teaching the nations, I magnify it because I want to make my fellow Jews jealous. Why? Because in this way I might save some of them. If their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? So important to note that he says, now I speak to you Gentiles, and I magnify this uh, so as to make the others jealous. We want them, even though right now perhaps they have rejected, as a rule, have rejected the Lord, uh, we want for them to obey the gospel. And so he is magnifying this to make them jealous and cause them to come back to him. Which is how we get into 16, 17, and 18 of Romans 11. If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, we're grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. Well, don't be arrogant toward the other branches. If you are, remember, it's not you who support the root. It's the root that supports you. What does he mean by this? Well, he's talking about Jew and Gentile. The, the Jewish nation is the nation that God made, that God planted, that God cultivated. And at this point, as he says, you know, if the dough is holy, the whole lump is holy. If the root is holy, the branches are holy. So the thing that was begun under the law of Moses is good and is right and has its, you know, that's the basis upon which all these other branches come forth. And this branch now that is these Christians who are obeying the gospel is perhaps, as he said, some of the branches were broken off, but you a wild olive shoot are grafted in and share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. So they're, they're a wild olive tree, not a cultivated olive tree, not part of this orchard or whatever it is that you have when you have olive trees. Is it a vineyard? No, there's no vines, right? It's an orchard, I would think. Olive orchard? That doesn't sound right, but whatever. Um, you're grafting this branch in. It wasn't part of this, but it can still get what it needs. It's still an olive. And it can get what it needs, it can get the nourishment. But as he said, don't boast, you know, don't be arrogant toward the other branches, the natural branches. If you are, remember, it's not you who support the root, it's the root that supports you. Remember that we need, we need the Jews. We, we need uh, what they were and what they did and, and what they accomplished in the Lord. That's necessary. Uh, all of this Bible is written by Jews. Jesus came and lived as a Jew. I mean, this is all he's getting at, saying these are the bases. This is what you're grafted into. So we move to the 19th through the 24th here. Then you will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. <laughs> well, that might be true, right? Okay. 
yes, it's true, there were some who were not faithful, and so they were broken off. And that made room for you to be grafted in. Fair enough. It, they were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast now through your faith. So don't become proud, but fear. If God didn't spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen. But God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they if they don't continue in their unbelief, will be grafted back in. For God has the power to graft them back in. If you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own? Right. So yes, they may have been broken off and you stand fast in faith, but he said, this is not a reason to be proud. This is a reason to be fearful. Why fear? Because if he didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. If you don't continue in his kindness, you've got to be faithful to him. And if you don't continue to be faithful and you don't produce fruit, well, he'll cut that off too. That's the idea. Kindness and the severity of God. Uh, this is an interesting thing. It's like, it's like you know, binary, you know, black and white, uh, on and off, light and darkness. There's kindness and there's severity. Severity to those who have fallen. Well, why have they fallen? Because they rejected his kindness. They rejected the Son when he came. They had their chances and, and they wasted those things, didn't accept them. So in their case, God is severe, and that's true. If we're not faithful to him, we have a reckoning coming. But kindness, severity, and kindness. Severity to those who've fallen, kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And they, even they, if they don't continue in that unbelief, will be grafted back in. That's also true, and that's why he's saying what he's saying. That's why he magnifies his service to the Gentiles. He wants to provoke them to jealousy so they'll come back, so they'll obey the gospel and be grafted back in. That's the goal here. We are on a saving mission. But yeah, first thing he said is, look, I'm talking to you Gentiles about the Jews. Here's what, how you need to look at it. It's not you who support the root. The root, the root supports you. You need them. This wouldn't be if it weren't for them. But also, remember, if he didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. So there's a call there saying, look, they, they, it may be true that they've rejected the Lord, and right now they're, they're not in good grace, those who have not obeyed the gospel. But that will be your lot too if you don't obey him, if you don't continue in his kindness. Don't think that he wouldn't, because he did that with the, the natural branches. How much more are those that are grafted in? If you graft a branch into a fruit tree or a producing tree and it doesn't produce fruit, you clearly are not going to keep it there. You cut it off and do another one that will bring fruit. That's the illustration. And the final point is 25 to 33. The meaning of this is that God is the last part of it, that God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Okay, so what all of this is getting to that point, that both Jew and Gentile stand in need of mercy, and he gives mercy to all in Christ Jesus. That's the whole point of these verses, okay? <laughs> so now, 25 to 33, Lest you be wise in your own sight, O Gentiles, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As, I regard, or as regards the gospel... They are today enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. 
just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so too they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you they also may now receive mercy. God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. The depth, the riches, uh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, inscrutable his ways. So he said, yes, it's true. Uh, there's a partial hardening that has come upon Israel until the fullness of the nations comes in. Just talking about in the first century there, it's true. Some of them are just not listening and they're not going to listen until the time is right, when they will be allowed to obey. They will be allowed to be saved, as he says. But for a time, it's that way, so that they'll be brought in, and then the fullness of the nations will be in, and all Israel will be saved. So that's why he says, as regards the gospel, they may be enemies for your sake right now, but as regards election, they're beloved for the sake of the forefathers. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So they, they've not been cast off. They've not been thrown aside, even though right now there is a good bit of rejection there. It doesn't have to stay that way, and it may not be. There will be some who obey. So that's, that's all he's saying. Everybody who becomes a Christian does so through the mercy of and forgiveness of God. And that's how God saves us all today, whether Jew or Gentile. And that is why we speak of the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable his ways. He has found this way of uniting the whole world both those who have been cultivated and brought to this point, in some sense, if you will, shown favoritism, they nonetheless have been brought level with everybody else because they also need mercy. We all need mercy. That's why we become Christians. And there is what God has done. And that's uh, the end of that in Romans 11 so that you get to 12 with this conclusion i appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of god to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to god which is your spiritual worship do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of god what is good and acceptable and perfect this should be part of Romans 11. It's actually the conclusion of Romans 11. God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Well, who presents sacrifices, right? Well, the priest. He just made you all priests, even though you're not Jews, you're Gentiles. That's what's happening in this verse. You're all priests. Every Christian is a priest, and you are offering sacrifices of right living, which is your spiritual worship or logical service is another rendering of those words. But logical is just according to the logos, according to the word. Do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewal of the mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. Yes, conformity to the world is, you know, going along to get along, but that's not our call. We want to be at peace as much as is possible. It's true, but that may not be in our hands. What we are called to do is to be right with God and be transformed in the renewal of the mind. By testing, we discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, what is perfect. That also is a priestly duty. The Levitical priests are all about testing things to see what is true, what is clean, what is right. There's a, a lengthy reading about all the skin conditions, which are, called, which are translated leprosy, but it means skin conditions, probably including leprosy. There's lengthy passages in the, in the Old Testament there um, about 
how the Levites test them, you know, put it on this garment, or if it has this color, if it has that color, if it's cracked, if it's not cracked, you know, all the, there's all these tests about how you're going to deal with this thing. That's their job, if you will, to use what the Bible tells them to make sense of what they see, what's been presented to them, so that they know what the right choices to make are. Is this one where somebody has to be isolated? Is this one where you wash away? Is this one where you get rid of the clothing uh, or the garments that have touched it or whatever? They just need to know how to deal with it and the Bible tells them how to deal with it. That's the point, is that you as a priest are also, by testing, discerning the will of God. What is good, perfect, acceptable? That's all. What should we be doing? What's the right, what is the prescription of the word of God for this? So in that way, you also are priests. That's true. We daily are making choices based on the scriptures about what we should do and what we should not do. So when he says, yeah, present your bodies a living sacrifice, that implies that you're a priest. You're making sacrifices. So also does by testing, discern the will of God, what is good, perfect, and acceptable. That's also a priestly duty. So yes, we have become priests. And as he speaks to us Gentiles, even though we are not Jewish, we are priests. And that comes up in Hebrews. Of course, our order is not Levi. It is Melchizedek. Another topic for another time. But in summary on Romans 12 here, um, we would say your bookends are this one and two here, and then uh, Romans 12, 21, on the other side of this, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So we start, you know, with this idea that we're all priests, we're all making sacrifices, we are all of us testing and discerning the will of God daily. On the one hand, on the other hand, 1221, do not be overcome by evil, overcome evil with good. This is really the, these are the bookends on the thought here because uh, the thread uh, that, that ties these together is verse three. By the grace given me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned. This is the thread that ties it all together. Think of yourself with sober judgment. This thought began in chapter 11, where, you know, again, the Gentiles are not to exalt themselves over the Jews and vice versa. But where he, he's, making, he's making it plain, yeah, it's true right now. You, there's even enmity in some cases. Um, they've rejected this, and yet you've been grafted in, but don't boast because you need that tree. That's a humility. That's about being realistic about... You know, who are you? What are you? Well, you've been brought in. You're, you're Johnny come lately. <laughs> this tree has been growing a long time. You've been grafted in. That's true. Um, so that is, a, um, that is a humility, if you will. A, a self-awareness, yes, but a, a humility, too. I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. Well, meaning to think of yourself with sober judgment. I mean, you've you got to be right about this. He's not saying they're bad people. He's just saying recognize, recognize your spot here. Recognize your place here. Um, humility characterizes this, and that's how we get, t um, uh, you know, the bookends that we do. With We started with that conclusion that you live presenting yourself a living sacrifice. And on the other hand, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We're getting there by means of humility. So it starts there in three, 
and it progresses from there, um, you know, all the way down, all the way out, really. But you start to see here a series of thoughts that are connected, actually, by humility. I guess I would say uh, many times I've come to the passage and kind of wondered how these things relate, or uh, why is that there? What is what, what purpose does that serve in this place? Is this just a bunch of non sequiturs, <laughs> a bunch of lists, a list items that are not really, you know, why are we doing this? Um, not that there's anything wrong with what it says, but just you know, what ties this together? What's the thought here? Well, the thought is humility. Right? Verses 4 through 8 talks about one body and, and uh, many members in the body. In one body we have many members. The members don't all have the same function. In the same way, though we though many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts according, uh, that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. That's Romans 12, 4 through 6 there. But... This is a humility aspect, right? We're all parts of the body. We're not all the same part of the body. And yet all the parts are necessary. Nobody wants to do without them. Uh, amputation is considered a bad thing when that happens. You don't want to be without parts, whatever parts they are. And that's humility. We, we don't all have the same function. That's okay. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us, meaning perhaps you have different opportunities in life or different things that you can do in life or different situations, whatever it might be. We all have different things, and that is also okay. Approach this with humility. Uh, which is where he goes with, you know, use them in this way. If somebody can prophesy, he should do so in proportion to faith. If somebody can serve, well, he should serve. If someone can teach, he should do so. If someone can exhort, he should do that. If someone can contribute, he should do so generously. If someone can lead, he should do so with zeal. If someone does acts of mercy, he should do that with cheer. <laughs> Gladly, not begrudgingly, not holding it over people's heads which is also informed by humility because you recognize that you too are in the body and that could be your situation, but for the grace of God. So you show some mercy. Or as the proverb said, spread, you know, cast the bread onto the many waters. In days to come, it will return. You never know. But four through eight, talking about that one body has many members, is humility. You're a part of the body. You may not be the most important one, if you will, or the most whatever it is. Think soberly about the self. And then the ninth verse, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Yeah, let love be genuine. What does that mean? Well, we have Jew and Gentile together. There's some animosity sometimes. Certainly we know that the mystery has just been given to them that uh, there's a partial hardening there. So yeah, that's tough. Let love be genuine. Then we come here, you know, from different backgrounds, uh, from different, you know, different ways of thinking about things, but we are united in the Lord then we need to love genuinely from the heart, not just, you know, be polite. <laughs> and then the 10th verse goes even farther. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Love one another with brotherly affection, meaning you have become siblings. Yes, Jew and Gentile are completely different nations, completely different families, and you've always kept your separate quarters. Dare we say separate but equal. But no, not like that anymore. 
you show brotherly affection in your love for one another. You're united. The way to get there is humility. You know, let go of the self, let go of the traditions, the past, the origins, all that kind of stuff. Humility. <coughs> I remember being in the house of uh, Larry, Larry Tomlin, who most of you know, I think, from Orange. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we were sitting with one of the members there who was really into the genealogy stuff. Sweet woman. Um, and just talking about how well, these people came over from here and they were doing this and this was wh why they settled these things and that's called that and uh, all this kind of thing. And she asked me, you know, where my people came from. And I'm like, well, they, they actually, you know, we've just kind of been here the whole time we're, we're Texas. Um, but then uh, she asked Larry, where, where'd your people, where, where, did you, where did you come from, Larry? And he said, oh, Daddy brung me. <laughs> That's about right. I like that humility approach. He said, yeah, Daddy brung me. <laughs> he just wasn't into that. I liked that. It made me realize, yeah, you know, it's fun to think about and, and learn about what happened in the past, but it, it's not really, I mean, it's in the past. It's gone. Those people are gone. They're not here now. You're all brothers in the Lord now. This is also um, where you see these other things. 11, 12, 13. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. These come from humility as well. Then the third, uh, 14th says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. That also is a humility. You're, you're selfless when you do this. You're realizing that the Lord blessed and did not curse. The Lord accepted bad treatment, mistreatment, injustice against himself in the service of the gospel, of the service of the higher calling of people being saved. You do the same if you have that humility. Fifteenth verse, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. This also is selfless. There are those that weep, and we weep with them. We, we're concerned for them. As he said, let love be genuine. Show brotherly affection. But it's also true that when people rejoice, we rejoice with them. You know, there, there's always that temptation to be like, yep, well, that's too bad. And I'm going to go on with my life, not let that affect me. Or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> must be nice. I wish I could, you know. This is not the right responses. <laughs> we join in with each other and help each other, whether it's good or evil that has befallen them. And again, the um, concept is restated in 16 through 20, which is about living in harmony. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but rather give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. You see, this is all under the header of live harmoniously. You don't be haughty, you associate with the lowly. You don't be wise in your own sight. You repay no one evil for evil. He had just said, bless those who persecute you. Now he says, repay no one evil for evil. Give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And that 1217 takes specific, or I guess a particular importance to me uh, now. Uh, one, of the, one of the people that I was listening to in a totally different connection, completely secular, but a history uh, talk, a podcast, which I really enjoy, was talking about honor code, the ancient honor code. And I realize that he's right, and this is actually what the world thinks of. Um, as true honor, but honor was to owe 
you know, owe no one anything that doesn't get repaid, whether friend or foe. That's the ancient honor code. Pay everybody back, whether they're friends or whether they're foes. That's the way that the Japanese think of honor, for example. And that's the way that the knights of old thought of honor, right? That's the world. Romans 12, 17 says, repay no one evil for evil. Um, it was brought to the attention of, I believe it was Confucius. Maybe it was the Buddha. Regardless, they brought it to the attention of a philosophical thinker slash potentially religious leader um, that Jesus said something like this, you know, that you bless those who curse you. Um, pray for those who persecute you. And he said, um, if we repay evil with good, with what shall we repay good? And it seems to make sense in a way of thinking, but the problem is that it assumes that the, you know, that the money is yours, and it's not. It's God's. You're the one who is a servant here. You're a pass-through, a vessel. God said, repay no one evil for evil. Give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Not the honor code of the ancient world, but the what is actually honor, what is true honor, which is to be a servant in humility, selfless enough to be consistent with God's resources to show kindness, mercy, forgiveness in the world that others might be saved, even if it hurts you. It's the kind of service that we do. And again, in the 18th verse, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Yeah, you may not be able to do this, I think probably everybody has had that one neighbor, that crazy idiot. <laughs> probably. Uh, there's just some times when some dude is just angry from the time you say hello and you have no way of getting through or making any kind of peace and you wonder, what is eating him? What happened? <laughs> I, I cross the street when I walk by his house, you know. Everybody has seen that, I think. But, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. We ought to be peaceable. We ought to be able to get along most of the time. And we are on a saving mission. So, that is also humility. The 19th verse uh, and the 20th verse we haven't read yet, but they follow in the same vein of harmony. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. It is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. By so doing, you heap burning coals on his head. Which is not to say you want burning coals on his head. It's to say, this is the strongest response. To pay somebody back tit for tat is not strength. That's just the world. Strength is to be selfless and to show the good and the mercy of God even in the face of mistreatment and injustice. That is strength. Vengeance is God's. He will repay. You don't need to do it. That's the idea. If the enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. By doing so, you heap burning coals on his head. This is the greatest victory, actually. Um, and I'm reminded of the time that the prophet blinded an entire army and led them into the center of the city. <laughs> an invading army came. He blinded them, led them into the center of the city, gave them their sight back, and they realized they were dead meat. They're in the middle of the city. <laughs> and the king said, shall we kill them? He said, no. Give them a feast. Send them on their way. And they never had trouble from that country ever again. <laughs> that was the strongest response. 
That's the meaning. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. By doing so, you heap burning coals on his head. That is the way to do. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what that prophet was doing. And it worked. It worked better than, than defeating that army at that time. They would have raised another army. They'd have been mad. The loss of life, the, lo you know, the harm to their families, all that stuff. That's real. But that's not what happened. The prophet showed them that he had great power, brought them into the city, and made sure that they stayed alive when the king would have killed them. They went back to their town, uh, to their country, and reported these things, and that country didn't harass Israel. This is the way it should be. You overcome evil with good. When you show God's grace and you show God's mercy and you hold forth God's word, then you get God's results. And his results are always better than ours. He accomplishes things that you and I cannot accomplish. His wisdom is greater. So that's the meaning there in Romans 12. And that is why he goes on in the 13th, in verse 1, to say, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. There is no authority except from God, and those that do exist have been instituted by God. The Jews there, up to this point, have been accustomed to their own theocracy, Israel. But now they're found in every nation. And just like the Gentiles in those nations, they're subject, as it says, let every person be subject to governing authorities. There's no authority except from God and those that exist are instituted by God. It's not the divine right of kings. He's saying that government is good. Governance is good. Anarchy is evil. Um, governance is good. That's authority. God has that in place. It's human, so it's not perfect, but it's far better than anarchy. But it is in that connection that he says this. This also is think of yourself with sober judgment. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Think with sober judgment. It, you know, when a person is not willing to be subject to, you know, the, the norms of polite society, be nice to their neighbors, not willing to be subject to government, government and governing authority, you know, there's something wrong with that person. That, that person is very arrogant and thinks too much of themselves, like they know better than everybody else. That's not how it should be. And in this context, we're saying... For them, you know, the, the Gentiles shouldn't think of themselves as better because they've been grafted in. Be thankful that you have a spot and, and stay in that kindness or you also will be cut out. And on the other hand, you Jewish persons who now are Christians, you find yourselves in all these other countries, be subject to those governments. The Israelite government is no more. There's humility in this that is the thread that ties it all together. Think of yourself with sober judgment. So these are the things that he's getting at in Romans 11, 12, 13. It's still about Jew and Gentile. It's still about how do we integrate, how do we get along. Um, and this has to do with being selfless and realizing that we are one nation under God. We are the Christians, the children of God. All right, so we'll pick up 13 next time. I thank you for your attention. And uh, today, if you're not a Christian, become a Christian. We'll help you to obey the gospel of Jesus and baptism for forgiveness of sins. If you are repentant, realizing that you're lost, that you have done wrong to God and stand in condemnation, well, you need to be saved, you need to be delivered from that condemnation will help you to obey the gospel. If today you are a Christian who has not been staying in that kindness of God and are in danger of being cut out, you've got to cut it out. Stop doing that. Let us pray with you that you can be restored to him 
also if you are repentant. If you need our prayers today, if you need to be baptized, please let it be known now by coming to the front while we sing, uh, stand and while we sing.